confused about what is manhood, what is womanhood, and how do we understand this. So as Christians, it's a really good thing for us to learn what God has to say about it. Amen? Amen. So we're going to dive into what the Bible says. And, and this question, I guess, that the world has kind of come up with, which I guess we've kind of heard it honestly recently quite a lot. It seems like a very simple question, but it's actually apparently not. You want to know what the question is? Maybe you guys can say it with me. What is a woman? What is a woman? Who knew that we would be asking this question? Literally, like in government, like the, the big dogs, they're like, what is a woman? Hmm. Like they're making documentaries about it. Like it's so controversial. It's crazy. But here we are. Here is where society has apparently progressed to that we don't even know what a woman is. So obviously, biology tells us that a woman is an adult female. Very obvious, right? It's pretty obvious, but as kind of Pastor Mealy kind of addressed a few weeks ago, we learned that the idea of manhood and womanhood actually goes a lot deeper, even beyond a biological perspective. So we're going to learn what a woman is, besides the fact that she's an adult female, it's kind of obvious, but we're going to learn what a woman is, what the Bible says about femininity and womanhood. So you guys ready? Ready to dive into it? So good, so good. So as kind of like the root issue, I kind of, every, with everything that I, I seek God about, where I go in the Word, any topic, I kind of tend to look at like, what is the root issue here? What is it that people are really trying to address? In this question of what is a woman, really when you look at the baseline, I guess, it's a question of equality. Right, you have trans rights, uh, women's rights, all these different kind of rights. Everybody wants equality. Our world literally is just screaming. Every issue in our world is about equality, right? Racial equality, feminine equality, whatever it is. Apparently, everybody's just fighting for the right to be equal. That's the world's perspective. So, really, what it comes down to is a question of equality: is what rights do I have in order to function and to flourish as a human being? And the world does it in very wrong ways, let's just say that, in a very distorted way. And what's funny is in this apparent search and desire for equality, we've actually completely trampled on the idea of femininity, right? In this whole debate about what is a woman, what a woman, what a woman is, and a woman, is it the way that she dresses? Apparently not, because you don't have to ascribe to a certain dress code, and then that's sexist to say women should only wear dresses and enjoy pink. Have you heard, like, gender reveals apparently are transphobic and sexist, and, you know, how dare you say women like pink? You don't know that. I'm like, whatever. Whatever. Like, they're mad about everything. But apparently woman isn't what she wears, and apparently it's no longer the genitalia. Apparently it's no longer, and it's not even just physical, apparently it's mental. It's, honestly, our world is so confused. Everyone is so confused, what is a woman? So this is a question of equality, right? This is the whole basis of the argument is everybody wants equality. So it would be fitting if we address that first, because when we talk about manhood and womanhood and this, the whole way of functioning with a context of marriage, because we're in our relationship series, so we're going to look at this in the context of marriage, but when we look at it, really that's what we're looking at as the baseline. So it's good to address this first and foremost. So in order to do that, which what I love about the Bible is it's literally first page stuff. Like you literally don't have to search for it, just open up page one of the Bible. It addresses this issue. We see in the very beginning in Genesis, men and women right, because they're separate and distinct and individual, man and woman is made in the image of God, right? He is made man and woman in His image and in His likeness. So that's the foundation, right? And this is the whole point, is our value as human beings isn't in what we do, isn't, isn't in how we act, isn't in what we display on the outside. Our value as a human being, what the Bible says, is in the fact that you were made in the image of God. This is the whole point. So we don't have to fight for equality in this sense because we understand, no, our value, we are equal. Under God, God has said we are equal. I don't need to try to strive and fight and get my voice heard because I understand, I have a conviction, God has made me equal to a man in value. That's what His Word says. But the world doesn't see it like this. In fact, the idea of biblical femininity, the world sees as very oppressive. It sees it as weak. 
It sees it as something that's not something we should work towards. They see it as unequal. So this is the basis of the argument for Christians, but the world sees it as different. And that is because what feminists don't want to admit, society hates women. Society hates women. And the reason I say that is because in this apparent fight for equality, right, from the feminist side, I guess, we're telling women that she should do everything except be feminine in order to be equal to a man, right? We're telling women not to be women. Don't have babies. Don't get married. Completely deny your maternal instincts. Take control of your career. Don't have children because they're going to get in the way. Do whatever you can to become a man in order to be great and successful. This is the idea. Without even knowing it, maybe, the whole feminist argument is literally denouncing what it is to be a woman. The whole idea of femininity. So this is the whole basis of the argument here is equality. And in the apparent search for equality, our world has completely trampled and destroyed what it is to be feminine, what it is to be a woman. So let's dive into it. This is how if we are made in the image of God, and in fact, this is what makes us equal. What's beautiful about this idea is it's not just that God has made us equal in value. We are equal in value. But what's beautiful about this image bearing of a human being is in their distinct forms, male and female, God has made such distinct differences in each gender in order to display His image. This is the beautiful thing because even though we both equal are made in the image of God, we individually display that image in many different ways. This is a beautiful thing and this is what the world doesn't want to admit, right? There's no distinction. We're all just human and don't try to complicate it by putting society's idea of gender. It's This is the idea. But this, in fact, is God's beautiful design. Is gender is binary. You have male, you have female and individually and beautifully we display the image of God. So Pastor Andrew kind of talked about this a little bit last week, about how masculinity actually displays the image of God. And what he spoke about was that God Himself refers to Himself as a loving Father. And because of that idea of God being a loving Father, we see this aspect of masculinity. Someone who provides, someone who leads, someone who protects. These qualities are in men and it reflects the actual image of God in such a unique way that women may not necessarily cultivate. And so what about women? What is it about women or womanhood or femininity that actually displays and reflects the image of God? Well, we're going to get into it and we're going to actually address a a scripture that's not very popular. Just going to say it. It's not popular at all. It's Ephesians 5. Paul is addressing a very uh, progressive society, right? This is in the middle. Like it's the Romans were crazy, right? They had... Crazy stuff was happening there. But Paul is talking to the church in Ephesus. And in Ephesians 5, we're going to read it, verse 22. It's a word that people don't necessarily like. It starts with S. Maybe you guys can say it with me. Submission. Submission. I know, I'm going there. Submission. Some of you just kind of cringe back a little bit. You're like, oh, no. We have to talk about it. And the reason that you cringe back is because society views this as really oppressive, right? This exact scripture is used by non Christians, atheists, even progressive Christians to try to make a case that this is talking about inequality, right? So let's read it together. We're going to talk about submission. Ephesians 5 22. Do you guys have your Bibles? Good. 22, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its saviour. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Very controversial, right? Now, this is what happens here. This is what the world looks at. They see this idea of, we have two ideas. We see submission and headship. These are the two ideas we see, submission and headship. And what the world will look at when they read this, and honestly, what it, it kind of seems like common sense. You read what Paul says, is like a man is the head of a wife and a woman has to submit. Your mind kind of sees this idea of one is on top, one is lower. That doesn't really seem like equality to me, right? Well... In fact, it actually does. It's a beautiful image of who God is. But this is the whole point, right? Submission and headship, you have these two ideas. And before we go further, I just need to address that this 
is in the context of a godly marriage, right? This is in the context, never does Paul say, or anywhere in the Bible does it say, that women have to submit to every single male in the entire world. That's not true. That's not the way it is. What it says is, wives, submit to your own husbands. Because this is in the context of marriage. And so within this context of a godly marriage, I need to make it very, very clear that if you are in a relationship or in a marriage where your husband is not doing his role to protect you and to keep you safe, in fact, he is harming you. You have no role of submission here. You do not have to submit to an abusive man. I need to make this very clear because a lot of women stay in situations because they think that they are honouring God by staying married. You know, I don't want to get divorced. I'm just going to submit. I'm just going to do what he says and that somehow is honouring God. As soon as there is danger, as soon as there is harm and your husband is no longer taking that role of protection instead he is harming you, this does not apply. So can we get that real, real clear for a second? This is in the context of a godly marriage. And so this is what Paul is talking to, is addressing the idea of submission and headship. And what he's talking about when we talk about submission, the Greek word for this means to be put under, to be put under. So it's literally taking something and putting it under, submitting it. And then we have the idea of headship, which means pretty much to lead, right? It's a, it's a responsibility, it means authority. So we have submission is to be put under, and then you have headship, which is authority. And kind of like I'd already said, when I, even when you explain these in the original language, it does kind of seem like there's not equality here. It does kind of seem like one is above the other and one is below the other, right? Right? Well, this is, I understand why the world views this. I understand why they think there is a case for inequality in Christianity, if you were to look at it with your own logic. But in fact, what's beautiful about this is Paul is actually suggesting the opposite. Right, he's suggesting the beautiful balance of God, and what he talks about in 1 Corinthians 11 is very similar. He's addressing the same kind of idea, but the church in Corinth were like crazy, like they had women um, goddesses, right? So they w- literally worshipped women. This would be the progressives of the society. This would be the feminists of the society. And what Paul, Paul talks about in verse 11, in chapter 11, is he addresses the issues of head coverings. Who's read that? Head coverings. For the sake of time, I won't read it, but in your own time, go and read, maybe have a skim over it if you have your Bibles out. But Paul is addressing this culture. He's talking to the church. And what he's doing here is he's correcting the wrong uh, roles. He's correcting a matter of function, right? Because we know that we're made in the image of God, but it's a case of function that is the problem here. So what he says to women in a very progressive society where women think that they are above men, and in fact, they actually kind of were because the society was very dramatic driven to female gods, Paul is saying, cover your head when you come into church. And the reason he is saying that is because it's a symbol of submission. He's teaching submission here. What this head covering represented was as you cover your head and you sit in church with your husband and family, what you are saying is in a culture that's very much the opposite, that's very much worshipping women, I choose and I'm choosing to communicate this to everyone around me. I choose to take a role of submission and my husband is my covering. This idea of a head covering was a physical symbol of a spiritual reality. She understood that she had a covering that was her husband. This is so beautiful. It's a beautiful idea. In fact, we see this in, in, even in traditional weddings. Who loves weddings? Yeah. Who loves a good wedding? I do. I work a little bit with weddings and I really love the traditional wedding stuff, right? It's, it has a lot of Christian values in it. The world doesn't want to admit it, but it is what it is. It's Christian. But what's beautiful about weddings is we see this symbol symbol kind of come through. You have the bride wearing white that symbolizes purity and virtue. And she walks down the aisle with her father. Her father is walking her down this aisle. And then we come to this beautiful moment where they get to the end of the aisle where the husband is standing. And the father hands over his daughter to her soon-to-be husband. And this moment here is so significant because the father walks her down the aisle and hands her over and says, I once was responsible for her. As the head of her household, I was responsible to protect, to provide, and now I'm choosing to hand over that headship and that covering and hand over responsibility to the husband. 
This is a beautiful role. And this is why fathers give away daughters at their wedding. It's an idea of transferring this authority and headship over to the husband. And then the woman, as she stands there, she takes the veil off and she takes the last name of the husband, this family name of the husband. What she is saying is that I submit to the mission of this household. It is a submission. She puts herself under the mission. So this is a beautiful idea and the world hates it. The world hates it. They hate the idea of submission because they think it screams equality. So this is the whole point, right? If we're made in the image of God and that means we are equal, how, you may ask, does this idea of submission reflect the image of God, right? If, how, how, it doesn't really seem equal to me. Well, I'm glad you asked. Well, Paul actually addresses this in the first part of this text in 1 Corinthians 11. In verse 3, he says, But I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ and the head of a wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. Now this is really important because this will help us understand the concept that submission actually is a beautiful image of equality. And the reason is because Paul makes a really important parallel. He makes a parallel between the Trinity and marriage. This is beautiful. Let me explain it like this on the board. So he's first talking about this idea of the Trinity, right? You have the Father, bear with me. And then you have the Son, and then you have the Holy Spirit. This is the reason I do a circle is because they are all one, right? Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the same oneness that we see in regards to marriage, you have the husband. I'm going out a little bit, but you get what I'm talking about. And then you have the wife. So this is a beautiful image of oneness. The same kind of concept you see in oneness in the Trinity, you see that the two become one in marriage. But he makes this statement. He says, as the father is the head of the son, so the husband is the head of the wife. Now, let me ask you a question, a very important question. Is the father in... Uh, sorry, superior to the, to the son. Is the son inferior to the father? Wow. It's not a trick question, no. If you were to believe that, that would be heresy. Oh. We love that. We don't like heresy here. If you were to believe that because the father is the head of the son, that means that he is superior in value, that would be heresy. So if that is not true, just because the Trinity functions in a matter of headship, the Father is the head of the Son, the Son submits to the Father, that is not a question of inequality, right? We understand the Trinity is equal in substance, but they have different functions. So this beautiful imagery is the same thing we see in the concept of marriage. So if you were to really truly believe that the idea of submission means that there is inequality, you would be a heretic because you'd have to be consistent with your arguments and believe that with the Trinity as well. So that just completely denounces the idea that submission means that you are less in value. So glad we cleared that up. It's good, right? So this beautiful image of submission is something that women have a gift to display. And the reason it is a gift is because we actually get to display the image of God as we submit to our husbands. That's beautiful. The fact that the Son, that Jesus Himself, chose to willingly submit to the Father is this beautiful image of the, tri- the, the triune God, right? This Holy Spirit, the Father, the Son, functioning in a communion of love. But there is this eternal principle of submission and headship we see in the Trinity. That means that this idea of headship and submission isn't because of sin. Because that's often what a lot of people will argue. It's what, because we're sinful, there has to be an order to balance everything out. It's actually not true. You can see that God had set this order even before sin came into being with Adam and Eve, right? But what's beautiful about this is the eternal structure of submission and headship is so beautiful. It's beyond even humanity. It's beyond you and I. It's beyond marriage. It is eternal because it's the triune God. We see it in the holy God. So this is a beautiful thing. So that means women or wives, I should say, the more you humbly submit to your husband, the more you become like Jesus. Because we display this idea of the image of God through submission, because 
the son submits to the father, the more you learn to humbly submit to your husband, the more you become like Jesus. So one way we display the image of God is through submission. The second way, we see it in Genesis. Again, we love Genesis. It is what it is. But we see a specific key word that is used to describe a woman. And we'll see it in verse 18, Genesis 2, 18. Then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. That's because we are made in the image of God. And there's Father, Son, Holy Spirit, trying in God. It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. So we see here that a woman is described as a helper. And this is another thing the world hates because when you think of the idea of a helper, it's like a sidekick, right? You have the main hero, you have Batman, and then you have Robin on the side just helping him. It's very clear that one superhero is a lot more powerful and superior than the other, right? The helper is not the main character. So this is the idea here is a helper is kind of less in in value, right? It's got a role that means it's less than. But this is not what the Scripture tells us. And the reason that we know this is that this idea of a helper does not diminish the role of a woman. The reason we see this is because God Himself, 16 out of the 21 times the word helper is used in the Old Testament, God Himself refers to Himself as a helper to us. God Himself says that He is our helper. What a crazy concept that we women are given the same role and term used to describe God. That is such an honour. So a helper is not a role less than. And why do we know that? Let me ask you another question. Are you ready for it? I know. Just it's not. It's, this one's not as hard. But is God inferior to human beings? No. Obviously not. If you believe that as well, you would be a heretic again. But that that, that literally proves the point. If God is a helper to humanity, He is our helper, but He is also not inferior. That means the role of a helper is not an inferior role. In fact, it's a beautiful, empowering role. So we display the image of God through our submission and through our role as a helper. Two beautiful concepts for what it is to be a woman, amen? Are you guys ready to go a little deeper? Good, I hope you're ready because we got a lot to cover. We're gonna go to Proverbs 31. Proverbs 31, if you have your Bible, open it up, get ready, it's quite long. Uh, It's not as long as the last scripture I read in the last preaching, don't worry. But it is quite long. This is the the woman who fears the Lord. Let me just take a sip of water, sorry. Yeah. Anyone like ASMR? (laughs) I love ASMR. But we see Proverbs 31, we see, I don't know, depending on what your translation is, we see this is a virtuous woman or an excellent woman or a woman who fears the Lord. That's what my translation says. And I love that, a woman who fears the Lord. And just some context, I guess, to this is, this is a poem and I did, uh, I took a hermeneutics class in Bible college where we looked at this text and I had a, a feminist she wasn't my friend. I was going to say feminist friend, but I, didn't, I actually barely knew her. She didn't like me afterwards, let me tell you that. But she had a lot to say about Proverbs 31. She was real angry about Proverbs 31 because what she saw when she read this was, okay, so some old guy ages away in, the, in history wrote about what his ideal woman is. And it's such an unachievable goal. And it's all about what she does and not about who she is. Wow. I was like, you saw that? Like I saw something so different, but it's all good. We'll we'll talk about it, right? And so the whole point, I guess, of this is what many people believe Proverbs 31 is. They believe it is written by a man about what a perfect image of a woman is. But in fact, what a lot of people don't know is that Proverbs 31 was written by a woman. Oh, I know. It was written by a woman to her son. Now, we don't know if her son Lemuel was a real person. We don't know, but because we don't really have much other, I guess, evidence of him as a, as a king. But we see this wife, this mother, sorry, who is giving instruction to her son who is a king. And this is a, a book of wisdom, right? So this is a proverb. It's a wisdom literature. It's to help him to navigate how to find a wife, how to find a godly woman who fears the Lord. So it's kind of like a checklist. And it's written as an acrostic poem. So uh, each letter of the Hebrew alphabet, the, each line is like the subs, uh, the what's it called, the subsequent letter, right? 
Like, you know what an acrostic poem is, right? You have like A for apple and then B for whatever. You make a poem out of the letters that, and it goes down the alphabet. This is what it does with the Hebrew Bible. And the reason that they do this is to make it easier to remember. So this is really something, the same way that they um, would sing songs of worship was to help remember theology. This is what is happening here. This woman, this wife, this mother is giving this poetry of wisdom in the form of an acrostic poem to help her son remember this is who you should look for in a wife. This is what a worthy, beautiful woman is. A woman who fears the Lord. So it's a checklist. So men, if you are not married and you have your eye out, write these down. This is going to be good for you. And for women... This also helps us to see what the fruit of a woman who fears God is. This is what this looks like. So it's going to help men. It's going to help women and for married men too. If you see these qualities in your wife, we'll see why. You better praise her when she does them. Amen? You better, you better encourage her. So this is for everyone. So you guys ready to listen? Ready to dive into it? Proverbs 31 verse 10. An excellent wife who can find. She is far more precious than jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not harm all the days of her life. She seeks wool and flax and works with willing hands. She is like the ships of the merchant. She brings her food from afar. She rises while it is yet night and provides food for her household and portions for her maidens. She considers a field and buys it. With the fruit of her hand, she plants a vineyard. She dresses herself with strength and makes her, heart, her arms strong. She perceives that the merchandise is profitable. Her lamp does not go out at night. She puts her hands to the distaff and her hands hold the spindle. She opens her hand to the poor and reaches out her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of snow for her household, for all of her household are clothed in scarlet. She makes bed coverings for herself and her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her household is known in the gates, her husband, sorry, is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them. She delivers slash sashes to the merchant. Strength and dignity are her clothing and she laughs at the time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Many women have done excellently, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands and let the work, her works praise her in the gates. Amen. 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 Beautiful text, right? Now, I don't know about you women, but I read that and I'm like, that is overwhelming. Like that, what a woman, right? Like this is what a woman is. It's overwhelming. It's you look at it and there's so much expectation. I felt really intimidated when I used to read this when I was younger. I was like, how the heck do you live up to this standard? That's a lot, especially in the time that they, this was written in, right? They didn't have a microwave, you know, crazy. But the, the, I guess the main point about this, it's a woman who fears the Lord. As the baseline here, we need to make clear that this Proverbs 31 woman is a woman who leans on the grace of God. Yeah. See, these attributes, it's about what she does, yes, but really what the root of it is, in everything that she does, it's who she is. It's because she fears the Lord, because she is a woman of wisdom and fear of God, what she produces is this. This is what she produces. And it's not in her own strength. It is not in her own strength. She understands to lean on the grace of God. So in all of this, before we dive into it, I know you're gonna get overwhelmed, women, but let me just tell you, before you get overwhelmed, understand that this is not done in your own strength, right? You suck as a human being. If nobody has told you that, you're welcome. You suck as a human being. You need God. You need God. We all need God. So this is done by the grace of God. So let's go into it a little bit. Just a bit of a, I guess, um, a, a baseline to this. We see this idea of a virtuous woman or an excellent woman. What's really interesting thing about this proverb is that I guess the Hebrew scholars kind of look at this and they see a lot of warlike analogy, right? A lot of war or military analogy in this. And, and you may think that and be like, what? I know I did when I first read this. I was like, wait, military analogy? Like, I don't see anything military about this. I see a housewife whose job is to cook and clean and 
serve her husband and children. How does this have anything to do with war or military? And what's beautiful about this is because obviously we don't read it in the original language. We see it in our human, underst- our, our, sorry, English Western understanding. The, re- the way that this is written, it echoes military campaigns, yeah. right? The poetry behind this, it talks about a strength in military. And what's beautiful about this is when I looked at the word an excellent wife or an, a virtuous wife, when I looked at this word for excellent or virtuous, depending on your translation, what the word here is the word chayil in the Hebrew, which means strength. But I looked a little bit deeper and there are actually a lot of different words for strength in the Old Testament Hebrew, right? I think there's like at least eight. I went to look, I looked up strength like, and there are so many different variations of the Hebrew word strength, and there's strength in different ways. Just like I guess in English, we have a little bit of understanding with that. You have like physical strength, and then you have mental strength. Same idea, right? It's different displays of strength. And the strength that is talking about here, it's referring to a forceful army. The strength of a forceful army, when you cross-reference it with other ways that it is used, it's literally talking about a forceful army, like a military campaign. And so this is really interesting because when I looked at this, I'm like, okay, so it should really say a strong woman if the word is translated to strength, but it wouldn't be accurate because it's so much deeper than that. So I went into this word a little bit of this idea of a strong, forceful army, and what it's saying like here is this warlike analogy that is being used, and this strength of a woman isn't an accident. It's not just, oh, you know, she's super strong, she's super good. This is something that she worked at. This is something that comes with, are you ready for it, wisdom. This warlike analogy is something that comes with wisdom. And this is a beautiful analogy the way I understood it, right? The strength of a man is he is at the front lines in a war. He is there fighting, he is protecting, he is doing, getting his hands dirty. He is there to protect and to lead. He's on the front lines. That's the strength of a man. The strength of a woman is a little different. She's not on the front lines protecting, grabbing out her sword and her armour and like slaughtering people. She's not doing that. Hers looks a little bit different. The strength of a woman, if the man's is to be the front lines protecting and leading, the strength of a woman is to be behind the scenes, kind of having a military strategy. She is like the brains behind it. She's the wisdom behind it. She understands that there is ways of doing things. The strength of a woman flows out of the wisdom that comes with the fear of the Lord. We see in the beginning of Proverbs, it says that wisdom comes by the fear of the Lord. The beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. This is a woman deeply rooted in the fear of God. And what this produces, her strength is wisdom. This is the whole point. And what I love about Proverbs is that this analogy of wisdom is personified as a woman. Have you guys noticed that? We see Lady Wisdom in Proverbs 8. It's such a beautiful concept. Where am I? Proverbs 8. Check this out. 8 verse 11. For wisdom is better than jewels, and all you may desire cannot compare with her. This is talking about Lady Wisdom. But look at this. We read in Proverbs 31. I don't know if you noticed. It sounds really similar. Verse 10. An excellent wife who can find. She is far more precious than jewels. So similar. That's almost identical. You have wisdom is better than jewels nothing can compare with her. Then you have an excellent wife is far more precious than rubies. Who is, who, who is he who can find her? They are so similar in the way they are written and they're written by different people. This is a beautiful image. So you have a comparison of what it is to be a woman and then you have this analogy and a parallel with lady wisdom in the book of Proverbs. So this is a beautiful image. Wisdom is what a woman is and it's not by accident. It's not she just is. It is deeply rooted in her fear of the Lord. This is the whole point. And so this is the point. I'll bring it back to um, my friend in Bible college who didn't like what I had to say. She hates Proverbs 31. She was talking about how, you know, we're talking about the whole, um, you know, she is far more precious than jewels or far more precious than rubies. And she was like, yeah, uh, I have an issue with that. Um, number one, a woman's value isn't in what she does. It's in who she is. So that's, there's that. Secondly, um, I don't want to be compared to a jewel. I don't want to be objectified. Like, how dare you compare me to an object? I don't care if it's precious. I am worth way more than the precious jewels in the... And I was like, kill me now. <laughs> get, get me out of this room. 
But what's crazy about this is she's actually, we were in hermeneutics class, which is interpretation. Uh, she was actually doing the opposite of hermeneutics in this case. She was viewing this scripture all through her feminist lens, yeah. all through her Western worldview of you are so worth it, you are valuable. The uh, common understanding of this text that she is far more valuable than rubies is to really, really just describe what a woman's worth is. Yeah. You are worth so much. That's actually not what this text is talking about. What this text is talking about is it gives this image of a valuable woman, a woman that is equal to a man, hello, in value. But it says that this virtuous woman whose strength is in her wisdom is so rare that you're going to have to seek her out. The fact that she is far more valuable than rubies, what it's talking about is the idea of being a woman that has this amount of wisdom and fear of God should be so rare that it is hard to find. So a woman who fears the Lord, I'm telling you, I know women that there are men lining up because they are so special. Their fear of God is so valuable. It is so different. You, don't, you look at everyone else and you're like, there's something different about her. That is rooted in her fear of the Lord. That's the point. So you're not gonna find this woman. This is the whole point. This is who is he who can find her? She has to be sought out, which means you're not gonna find her. She's not gonna fall from the roof while you're playing Fortnite. I'm so sorry, doesn't work like that. Better yet, let's be a little bit more realistic. You're not gonna find her in the clubs. You're not gonna meet her at a music festival. You're just not. A woman who fears the Lord so deeply, and ha- this is the fruit of it, by the way, she is serving. You most likely will find her in church. That's, that's what I see when I read this, so keep coming. But this is the point, it's not hyping up what your value is, you are so valuable. This is taught so wrong by so many churches and women's conferences, trust me, been there, done that my entire life. It's you're far more precious than rubies. I'm like, that's not what it's saying. It's saying that your, your fear of the Lord should be so rare that you're hard to find. You're supposed to be so rare. So this fear of the Lord produces a wisdom that is so rare. And it's hard to find. This is the whole point. Who is he who can find her? Which means men, you need to do some searching if you want to find someone like this. You've got to be super intentional about this. And when you find her, you found a good thing. That's what the Word of God says. He who finds a wife finds a good thing. So let's move on. Verse 11. You guys good? Yeah. We're loving it. Taking notes. Verse 11. The heart of her husband trusts in her and he, have no, he has no lack of gain. She does him good and not harm all the days of her life. So this I wanna camp on a little bit. She brings him good and not harm. When we go back to Genesis, we read that Eve in, her, in the original language, Eve means the mother of all living, right? Mother of all living things. And obviously, yes, it was prophetic that she would literally populate the earth and that's where the human race would come from. She would make babies. We love that. We love women and making babies, so good. But this is more than just physically bearing children. This idea of giving life is way more than just making babies, which women make all the babies, please. We want babies, we love them. Pop them out, one after the other, I love it. So good. All the women said, amen, love it. But this is more than just making babies and having children, it goes deeper than that. What this is saying, it's prophetic for women. The idea of what a woman is, a woman was created to be a life giver. Not just physically, in all aspects. And this is the interesting thing, right? In this, with the same capacity, I don't know if you've noticed, if men, you will agree with me, but I believe that women have such an incredible gift to recognise and discern the need in others. Do you agree with me, right? When you, you know, when you can walk into a room and, you know, men will just like, hey, how's it going? And you're like, yeah, I'm good. And it's like, great, I'm so glad, walks away. A woman will come over, hey, how are you? Yeah, I'm good. No, you're not. Yeah. What's going on? Something's going on. You know what I mean, right? There is such a difference. God has gifted women. It's this maternal instinct. It's this nature that we see in the image of God. It's different than just empathy, being able to feel what others feel. It's you are moved with compassion the same way Jesus was. It's you, want to, you see a need and you want to tend to the need. 
right? It's this idea of being kind and tending to the need in others. Women have such a gift. It's, what, it's literally the idea of giving life. Where you see something is dead and flat, women have the capacity to recognise it and to be able to turn it into something beautiful, to bring life in that situation. But here's the problem, with the same capacity to give life, women have the same capacity to take life. What do I mean by this? Women, you're listening. We are very good at gossiping. We are very good at having something to say about everybody around us. We're really good at it, right? Because you can recognize it. You see the need. You see maybe there is something wrong in that marriage. But it's not your job to take life in that situation and go and tell every single person in church, hey, I think there's something up with this couple. I think he's cheating on her. I think she's this. I think this. That, in that role, in that responsibility to be able to recognise and discern that there is a need, that something is off, you have a, a responsibility in this moment. You can speak life into this situation with that gift or you can use it to slander and to take life. Yeah. The same mouth that we can use to build others up is the same mouth that we use to gossip and slander. This is a really powerful thing, right? We see this in Proverbs as well, that life and death are in the power of the tongue. That is such a real text. And for women specifically, women are real good manipulators when we want to be, right? Oh no, I do it sometimes. We, we spoke about this the other day. I was like, you know, sometimes I'm trying to convince Andrew of something and you know what I have to do? Yeah, actually, you're so right. And then he was like, no, no, like I'm, I'm willing to hear you out. And I'm like, no, 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 I think your idea is so good. And that's when he wants to listen to me. And I know that, so I do it on purpose. It's so manipulative. It is what it is. <laughs> Trust me, your wife knows how to do it too. <laughs> But this idea here is that it is a gift that is supposed to be used for service. But women, sometimes in our sin, we can use this to try to elevate ourselves, to try to draw attention to ourselves, and without even knowing it, we're speaking death into a situation. This is the whole point. The same parallel that is made for lady wisdom and woman, we also see a different uh, comparison to the forbidden woman in Proverbs. Look at this in uh, Proverbs 7. It says, Say to Lady Wisdom, you are my sister, and call insight your intimate friend to keep you from the forbidden woman, from the adulteress with her smooth words. Smooth words, this is so important. Verse 21, with much seductive speech, she persuades him. With her smooth talk, she compels him. All at once, he follows her as an ax goes to the slaughter. It's really heavy text. And this is, yes, talking in context about a, a lustful woman, a woman who tries to lead him away into sin sexually. But I think this goes for many different things. That the same comparison that wisdom is something that you should seek out and grasp is personified in a woman. You see this idea as the forbidden woman. And what she does is she leads people down a path of destruction. She leads like an, ox, like an ox to the slaughter. So we as women have responsibility. Let me give you an example. Your husband has a super long, stressful day at work. And he comes home, and let's be honest, he's not in the good mood. He's not in the best mood. And he kind of snaps at you about something little, like the food's not ready on time. And, you know, I expected to come home and have food and I'm starving. What's happening? What did you do all day? It happens. I know, some of you are laughing. It happens. But as women, as a life giver, we have an opportunity in that moment. We can see this as an opportunity to just complain and to literally bring death into this conversation, to bring him down, to take life, or you can see it as an opportunity to give life, to recognise that he is stressed. Because we know it. As soon as he walks in, you can feel it. Trust me. He walks in and he's stressed and he snaps and he says something. You can take this as an opportunity to say, well, yeah, but I've been busy all day. Well, yeah, how, how dare you do this? I've done this, I've done this and this. And how dare you this and pointing the finger? That's taking life in that moment. You're making things a lot worse. I know it feels justified. I know he shouldn't be speaking to you like that, blah, blah, blah. That's not your job. Your job is to respond. So what is your response going to be? Are you going to bring death in this moment? Are you going to take life? Or are you going to recognise, okay, something's up. He's not in a good mood. And then say to your husband, hey, 
you didn't have a good day, I'm sorry, it's behind, it's coming, is there something else I can do to help? Do you want to talk about it? Which most of the time they don't, they just want to be alone. But what can you do in that moment to take the load off your husband? We saw that our job as women is to be a helper. In that moment, how can you give life? How can you speak into that situation? Because your tongue is so important. What you say is so important. It may may not seem like it's doing anything, but trust me, it is. You have a role. Either you can be a life giver or a life taker. Amen? Amen. Amen. So verse 13, she works with willing hands. She is like the ships of the merchant. She brings her food from afar. She rises while it is yet night and provides food for her household and portions for her maidens. Now, this is a really interesting point because we see a woman who's obviously a hard worker, but it goes way beyond just that she works hard. What we see is she's not just ticking the box kind of gal. She is somebody that does her work with faithfulness. Now, this is the beautiful thing, the analogy of the merchant ships we see here is in this context when, you know, you didn't have groceries that had everything you needed. This idea was when the merchant ship came to the docks of the town, you would be so excited to see what they had. You didn't know. Sometimes you had bread or not bread, um, what's what's something you'd have? Sometimes there'd be fish there. Sometimes there would be a different animal. Sometimes there would be all these seasoned fruit. Sometimes there wouldn't. And you'd be so excited to see what is it that this ship has for us in this town. You were so excited. It was an exciting thing. And this analogy is beautiful because what I think about this is in her hard work, she doesn't just tick the box. In fact, her family are so excited for what she produces, which means that she does it so faithful. She doesn't just put dinner on the table and be like, it's food, eat it. She actually takes time and effort and energy into doing and stewarding this role well. She actually stewards the mundane faithfully. Now I know this is not about like, you know, be a better cook. It's all good. This is not about comparison, right? This is not about reaching an unattainable goal. This is about analysing what do you do with your time, with the responsibilities that you have, whether it's around the home or maybe you are a full-time, uh, you work full-time and you know your time at home is limited with the kids, whatever, everyone's season looks different. But the question we should all be asking as women is with the time that you have, with the roles that you have, do you just kind of tick the box to get it done because you have to do it? Or do you see it as an opportunity to serve your household and do it faithfully? Now, this is a really big thing. It's is hard for, for a lot of us to hear because I've noticed that there's like a toxic mummy culture and it's like the stay-at-home mum. Like, it's a lot more popular now than it used to be, which I guess is great. You know, we love that mum stay home with the kids. But either it's um, your praise for the work that you do outside of the home and you see your children as a burden and that's great. You know, that's what the world sees is like, oh yeah, no, you go out and be a girl boss and provide for your family. Only the, the man doesn't have to do it alone. It's a toxic in that sense, but you also have another side where you have the toxic stay at home mom culture where the man goes out and he works super hard, really long hours. The mom stays home with the kids. She cooks and cleans, but she does the very bare minimum. It's like, yeah, I I was busy. I cleaned, I cooked, I ticked the box. But if you were honest with your time, a lot of the time is spent sipping wine and gossiping to your gals. Having your mum's group, having your your mum's club where you just want to have five hours a week to just sit and have tea and just gossip about everyone and, and complain about your husband. It's There is this toxic mummy culture that sees serving at home as a burden, right? The busyness of serving at home as a burden. Now, it's really interesting because you have these two opposite extremes, but there has to be a balance in the middle of if you are a stay-at-home mum and you have that time at home, what are you doing with that time? This season is not one that you'll have forever. Eventually, your kids will grow up then what are you gonna do with your time? What I love about the Proverbs 31 woman that we read is she's a hard worker. She's got things that she does, right? She goes to the merchant ship, she, she sells things, she buys a field. She is very, very active in her work, not just as a mom, but as a woman, as a person. She is a hard worker in all aspects. And what's beautiful about this is, this is before the industrial revolution. 
right? So like I kind of already said, you, they didn't have microwaves. You couldn't just go to the, the shops and get something that you were missing. You couldn't just, oh, we ran out of bread. Let's go take a two minute drive to the local Woolies and get a bread and then come home. It didn't work like that. This is what it was, the reality of a Proverbs 31 woman in this time was it talks about how her, her children don't fear the winter. Now this is really important because it says she was out in a field working with her hands. She was working in the field. She didn't have a bunch of servants that she paid to do it. This woman was working in the field. And even if she did, she would still utilize her time. Yeah. She's in the field, she's growing crops, she's harvesting. She's making sure in due season that she's being faithful with her role. Because if she's not faithful with her role, when the winter comes, she's not gonna have crops and food to feed her family. That's the reality of a Proverbs 31 woman. In fact, in her spare time, when she wasn't cooking and cleaning and out in the field growing literally everything that you had to eat, crazy, when she wasn't doing that, her spare time was spinning wool and hand sewing clothing at literally everything, like her bedspreads, her linen, the kids' clothing for the winter to come. She made sure that they were gonna be warm. She hand did everything by herself. Now, I'm not saying don't go buy anything and you have to hand make everything. That's not my point. My point was this is a hard worker. She has no excuse of I'm too busy. I'm too busy, I don't have any time, so I'm just gonna chuck a microwave meal and then here, eat this. Or, put up chicken nuggets in the oven and like, here you go, that's dinner, I'm busy. This is a, the Proverbs 31 woman takes the time that she has, yeah. that she does have, and she stewards, stewards that well. Yeah. As a stay-at-home mom, she understands her role is to take care of the household affairs. She makes sure that her kids are not gonna be cold in winter. She makes sure that when her husband comes home, like the merchant ships, he is so excited to see what it is that she has prepared for him. And let me ask you the culture of your home, women. You set the culture of your home more than you think you do, right? When mom is in a bad mood, everyone feels it. You know what I mean, right? When a, when a woman is in a bad mood, everyone knows it. You set the culture of your household and your kids feel it, your husband feels it. When he comes home from work and you're stressed and you're tired, he feels it. Everyone feels it. What is the culture of your household? Do you steward that well? And like I said, it's not about comparison. It's not to make you feel bad and, and put your expectations super high. It's about stewardship. Are you faithful with the time and the roles that God has given you? For some of us, it looks different. We're working. We don't have time to spend four hours on each meal. It looks different. But if you do have that time, are you chucking a meal in the oven and feeding your kids crap and sitting and scrolling on your phone for four hours a day? If you have the time, women, steward that time well. Use that time as worship to God in how you serve your family. Amen? Amen. We love a Proverbs 31 woman. But this is the other end of the toxic mummy culture, right? You have a type of culture that gets very, very child-centered, right? The, and we love children. Children are a gift. Don't get me wrong. But this is the problem is this other part of toxic mummy culture is the children become the center of the family. Now, I know you may be like, yeah, that's, you know, isn't that a good thing? Well, it's actually not. Because you are a wife before you are a mother. And what happens is a lot of times in marriages, right, you have a marriage, it's built on, you know, love and commitment and you spend so much time together and then you have a kid and then you get too busy. So you neglect date night. You have sex maybe every now and then, not very often because you're busy, you know, you're tired. And then you have another kid and then it just gets worse. You don't get better at managing your time, it just adds on. And then, 16 years later, your kids are growing up and they're doing their own thing and you have no relationships outside of the children. You and your husband have nothing left to talk about besides the kids. How do they do at school today? And there's nothing else that you talk about. And this is the problem is a lot of women get so, I guess, immersed in the role of being a mom that they forget you are a wife first. You are a wife first. 
And we see this example in Genesis 25 with um, Isaac and Rebecca. What's crazy is this, we spoke about this a few weeks ago, and you know, the foundation of this marriage was beautiful. It was God breathed and it was beautiful. But now we see a little bit later they have kids. And what happens here in this moment is the kids get in the middle of the marriage. And the, the interesting thing about this story is that they actually start to have tension around the children, right? The kids get in the center of their marriage. It no longer becomes about oneness as a mother and a father, or sorry, as a, a hus- husband and a wife. Your roles are now only just mother and father. You have lost that marriage, that commitment, that unity. So how often do you have a date night? Is it consistent? I know, like a lot of women, you're like, you know, how did you have a date night last week? Has to be once a week. Has to be once a week. Let me just say that. Even if it's just a couple of hours at night, get dressed up, go out, go to the movies, do something. Do you invest into your husband as much as you invest into your kids? If not more. Your first role as a woman, if you are married, is to be a wife. I remember asking my dad... And my mom, when I was little, you know how kids do it? You know, you're like, if I was in a fire and we, you know, everything was on fire and you only had to save one person, would you save me or would you save mommy? And I was real shocked by my dad's response. He was like, oh, I'd save mommy. And I was like, what? And he was like, yeah, it's all good. I'm like, but I'm going to die. He's like, it's all right. I've got a wife. I can make more. (laughs) I was like, what the... But he said, look, in all seriousness, I love you so much and with everything and I can't explain the love I have for you, but the love I have for your mother is so much more than that. I was like, that's not, I don't know if I like that. Everything revolves around me. I'm the center of your world. I'm your, your child, right? But as I grew older and I saw the commitment of my dad and my mom to each other, I'm like, I care way more about that, the love of my parents for each other, more than my mom being overbearing and protective of me. Trust me, your child cares so much about the intimacy of their parents. And they can see it. They can sense it. Do you invest into your husband even more, I would say even more, than you do into your kids? It's a real challenge. And yes, I know time is limited, but that's where wisdom comes in. You've got to make it work. Amen? Amen. So then we read in verse 25, strength and dignity are her clothing, and she laughs at the time to come. Now, this is the interesting thing about confidence, right? She laughs at the time to come. There's a sense of confidence about her. And what's beautiful about this is because what the world says confidence is, is very different to what this Proverbs 31 woman displays. She displays a sense of dignity about her, right? Strength and dignity. We see, we saw that strength is her virtue, right? Strength is this idea of wisdom. It's rooted in the fear of the Lord. Funny enough, we also see that she keeps her arms strong. Did anyone read that? Like she keeps her arms strong. She makes sure that, hey, if you need to carry a table, you can do it. Your arms are strong. You know how to lift. You're not like, I need a man. Like to an extent, yes, but she actually still stewards her role well, her body well. She takes care of her body. Women, we need to hear that because you get married, you think, oh, well, he's stuck with me. No, steward your body well. But this is the beautiful thing is what the world sees as confidence is so different to what the Bible says. The world sees if you are confident, it means that you have to show more skin. It means that you have to flaunt your body. It means that you have to draw attention to yourself. That's what the world says. The idea of confidence looks very different in the world. If you see a woman like half naked and like super happy about it, you think, whoa, she's so confident. How how did we get to that point? How did we associate immodesty with confidence? That's what the world does. But what's beautiful about this, it says strength and dignity are her clothing. She has a virtue about her that is rooted in her fear of God. There is a modesty in this moment. Her confidence is the modesty of a woman. So this is a beautiful concept because... What I love about the book of Proverbs is that it starts and it ends with the fear of the Lord. It starts and it ends. We see in the very beginning in Proverbs 1, talks about what wisdom is. It says, hey, like, this is what the Proverbs are about. It's about wisdom and knowledge and understanding all this stuff. And then it says that the beginning of wisdom 
is the fear of the Lord. In other words, this is the baseline. If you want wisdom, you better get this done first. You first better make sure that you fear the Lord. And then, so that's how Proverbs 1 starts. Then 31 chapters later, we see the very end here. It says, a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. The beginning and end of Proverbs is the fear of the Lord. And this is what a basis for a Proverbs 31 woman is. So what is a woman? If we're looking at a biblical perspective, we've, we've kind of gotten a little bit about how we display the image of God, right? Through submission, through being a helper. But we see, what is a woman? She is submissive. She is a helper. And in these ways, she actually displays the beautiful image of God. And then we see, what does it look like, right? What is the fruit of a woman who fears the Lord? But this is the thing about all of these things that I was talking about, right? Being faithful, being wise, Honouring God with what you, how you work, being a hard worker, all this kind of stuff that we've addressed in Proverbs 31. The root of this and the base of this is she has to be a woman who fears the Lord. Amen. Now, this is the goal. Everything else is just the fruit. This is a really important role because many of us, I think, would read that and be like, okay, this is what I've got to do. I've got to do this. I've got to do this. And then we start to do that ticking the box thing. We start to just get the job done. But this is the point. Instead of focusing on everything that we have to do to be a woman in a way that God says is a a virtuous woman, what we have to do is get to the basics. And the goal of this as a woman is be a woman who fears the Lord. That is your role. That is your responsibility. A woman is, we see it all throughout Proverbs, this personification of wisdom. If you want to be a woman that is the way that the Bible describes it to be. Her strength is in her wisdom. That is how we help our husbands, right? You know, when your husband's like stressed and doesn't know what to do, we have good ideas. Men, listen to us. This is a beautiful gift from God, but it doesn't come by accident. It comes out of a deep fear of God. And so this is the whole point. This is what a woman looks like, right? This is what a woman does. But who a woman is, is a woman who fears the Lord. So this is the point, is as women, if you don't hear anything else of what I said and you just hear this one thing, if you were to be remembered for one thing, be remembered as a woman who feared God above all else. Because if you choose to yield to God, And be a woman who fears God above all else. Everything else will just flow from that. This is all just fruit. You have to take care of the root issue. Your job is to tend to the root issue. It's are you a woman who fears God? Or do you care way more about what your mum club thinks, right? When you go out with the local mums and your crew, your mummy crew, I don't know what it is. But if you go out with them and, you know, they're all talking about something and you feel like you have to engage in gossip because what are they going to think of you if you don't have any input? What attention are you going to get if you don't have anything to say? That fear becomes a fear of man, not a fear of God. What about when you're at home and you're serving your kids and you see your, you know, everything and anything that is wrong with the situation. You're like, yeah, but I should get this, but I want this. And, and you look so self-centered. This really is the root because you fear, you fear others before you fear God. Yeah. In everything that you do, a woman who fears the Lord, she sees it as worship. Yeah. Maybe you don't view it like that. In every meal that you cook for your family, In every budgeting, I don't know, a lot of the time the women do the budgeting, love that. We're just better at it, managing the money. (laughs) But in every budgeting that you do, in every single role that you have as a wife and as a mother, do you see that as worship? Or do you just tick a box? This is the whole point, the, the foundation of what it is to be a woman. We see even in the very beginning, the reason that's, that Eve fell into sin is because she didn't fear God. She didn't fear God. And what happened after that, after she sinned, then she was like, okay, I see, the, I see now, I can see. And then she hid from God. Then you see the fear of God in a different way. She understood the reality of her sin. She was like, I should not have done that. Now I fear God. This is the whole point is that sin is birthed out of a lack of fear of God. So be a woman who fears God. This is the whole point. Is everything else is just fruit. 
the basis of what it is to be a woman, a woman who is wise, a woman who knows how to reflect the image of God in her submission, a woman who helps and serves, a woman who is a hard worker and is faithful. The basis, the root of who a woman is, is a woman who fears God. I love this analogy. I love that when Jesus rose from the dead, it was women that were there. It was women that really had this devotion and care. Yeah. I love that this imagery of Mary being at the feet of Jesus. Yeah. It's this devotion to God. In everything that you do, women, if you fear God, everything else flows from that. Yeah.